Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now to the shrine of the little flower, Royal Oak, Michigan, for the regular Sunday afternoon program of Father Charles E. Coughlin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the third in a series of important and fundamental lectures to be delivered by Father Coughlin covering the subject of finance and banking. It is entitled, The Abuse of Bonds. Following this important lecture, Father Coughlin will address you on the spiritual subject of a Christian in the modern world. The several lectures included in this series will prove to be most valuable for all those interested in rectifying the economic and sociological abuses which are current here and elsewhere. The facts and figures employed by Father Coughlin have been obtained from government documents. You are not only invited to write for a copy of today's lecture, but to convey its contents to your friends who will have had no opportunity of listening to it. In the pages of Social Justice, Father Coughlin will write supplementary articles on this same subject, which is related not only to the questions of labor, agriculture, and business in general, but to the major question of keeping out of war. All these subjects are handled by competent writers of Father Coughlin's selection. And now may I present to you Father Coughlin in his lecture entitled, The Abuse of Bonds. Ladies and gentlemen and friends, in last Sunday's lecture, I produced official testimony to show that the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned corporations, not governmentally owned. It was also indicated that a Federal Reserve Board consisting of eight men, namely the Secretary of the Treasury, the Comptroller of the Currency, and six appointees of the President, a Federal Reserve Board is constituted as a direct government control over these privately owned Federal Reserve Banks, and indirectly, therefore, over the local banks which belong to the Federal Reserve System. How well this governmental board exercises its prerogatives of control can be adduced, in part, from the contents of today's lecture. At the outset, and before any conclusions are drawn, permit me to quote the exact words of the Federal Reserve Act. This act, creating the Federal Reserve Banks together with the Federal Reserve Board, was passed, quotations, to prove or provide for the establishment of the Federal Reserve Banks, to furnish an elastic currency, to afford means of rediscounting commercial paper, to establish a more effective supervision of banking in the United States and for other purposes, unquote. Now, presumably, it is the business of the Federal Reserve Board to see that these objectives are attained. If they are attained, the Federal Reserve Board functions efficiently. If they are not attained, the Federal Reserve Board is inefficient in proportion to the degree of failure of the Federal Reserve Act to operate. The Federal Reserve Act, passed in 1913, assumes the legality, the morality, and the efficiency for the 15,000 or more private banks belonging to the Federal Reserve System to create money through the process of buying government bonds at 10 cents on the dollar and of making loans to private citizens, loans on which the banks collect interest on nine times the amount of currency money loaned to the borrowers. The 15,000 or more banks belonging to the Federal Reserve Banking System have in their vaults more than $18 billion of federal bonds, which these banks acquired by surrendering only 10% of the value of the bonds. And this 10% came from the excess reserves of the banks now holding these bonds. Therefore, 
90% of the federal bonds held by these 15,000 member banks of the Federal Reserve System were not purchased with actual cash. Nevertheless, the banker owners thereof collect interest on them and profit thereby. Let me put this abstract statement in concrete figures that are more understandable. Before the end of this fiscal year of 1940, the 15,000 banks owning the Federal Reserve System probably will have $20 billion worth of federal government bonds in their vault. The bankers will have paid $2 billion out of their excess reserves for the $20 billion worth of bonds. $18 billion worth or nine-tenths of the federal bonds will have come to the banks without their having made payment therefor. Now, at 3% interest, the banks would earn $600 million per year on the $20 billion worth of bonds. This $600 million annual profit through interest is represented by $60 million interest on bonds they paid for and $540 million interest on bonds they did not pay for. In other words, the taxpayers of the nation would contribute to the owners of the Federal Reserve Banks $540 million the first year as a fee to the bankers for their having performed the function of creating money by a stroke of the pen. But that is not all the profits gained by these private corporations on the bonds they possess, having paid nothing for them except 10% of their excess reserves. That is only the first year's profit. Over a period of four years, the length of a presidential incumbency. What do these profits total? How much will the taxpayers of America contribute to the private bankers for whom it is legal to purchase bonds at 10 cents on the dollar? Not counting the legitimate profit through interest, which the bankers make on the 10% of the bonds for which they actually paid, counting only interest gained on 90% of the bonds for which they did not pay, their profits without compound interest will amount to $2,160,000,000 for four years. However, that is only the beginning of their profits gained on bonds for which they paid nothing. There are at least two uses to which the bankers can put this $2,160,000,000. First, they can use all of that sum, or part of it, to purchase more federal government bonds at 10 cents on the dollar if and when they are issued by the federal government. If they use all of the $2,160,000,000, they can purchase another $20 billion worth of bonds, which, in turn, will pyramid their profits to astronomical figures. Second, they can use all of the $2,160,000,000, or part of it, to lend to manufacturers, shopkeepers, farmers, and home builders at 4 and 5 and 6 percent interest. If the bankers choose this latter use for their money, both federal law and custom permit them to lend ten times, yes, ten times more than they actually have, thereby enabling them to collect 90% more interest on the loans which they establish over and above what they actually loan be it understood by all the innocent or uninformed persons in this audience, that bankers do loan at least ten times more money than they actually have. 
All that is unbelievable. Nevertheless, it is the most astonishing fact associated with our present banking system and our present financial system, both of which are predicated upon debt, both of which are predicated upon exacting 90% more interest from the taxpayers and borrowers than is represented by real currency money actually loaned. As you know, the Constitution of the United States includes the clause that Congress has the right to coin and regulate the value of money and of foreign coins. Despite this constitutional right of the people to issue through Congress its own money directly and tax-free, Congress, the representatives of the people, permits the Federal Reserve Banks and their 15,000 owners to issue at least 90% of our money with a tax tag attached to it, a coupon bearing interest. Instead of Congress issuing the money tax-free in the first instance, with a nominal bookkeeping charge of no more than one-half of one percent, which would be adequate to care for printing, bookkeeping, and management, Congress, even in the case of the federal land banks, of the FHA, and of similar government lending agencies, borrows the money from the private bankers who create it, and then Congress lends it at 3 or 4 percent of the borrowing citizenry through governmental agencies. All this is so astonishing, so unbelievable, that many innocent persons labor under the impression that the government created all the money that the banks issued 100 cents on the dollar to borrowers, that the borrowers paid interest only on the currency money they actually borrowed. The majority of American citizens, not understanding these basic principles of money creation and banking, therefore were at a loss to explain why there is want in the midst of plenty why there is a scarcity of available currency money, why billions of dollars are exacted from taxpayers to meet the interest, which represent profits made by the members of the Federal Reserve Banking System on 90% of the bonds they hold, and which they did not buy with earned currency money. And the Federal Reserve Act was passed to furnish an elastic currency. The Federal Reserve Act was passed empowering the Federal Reserve Board, among other things, to see that this provision of elastic currency would be cared for. As a matter of fact, banks at present are not lending money to private citizens to any great extent. They are not lending it to home builders, to farmers, to manufacturers in amounts they could lend, probably because the high cost of borrowing is prohibitive to the citizen. And the high risk of lending is prohibitive to the bankers whose vaults are filled to overflowing with available credit and currency money, for which they must find some use very shortly. Otherwise, a collapse exceeding that of 1933 is in the offing for our entire banking structure. The banks themselves recognize these facts. Let me quote for you Mr. Edward J. Condlon, C-O-N-D-L-O-N, one of the financial writers in the New York Times. One week ago today, this gentleman said, quotations, beset with the limited demand for bank credit, 
on the one hand, and the problem of employing swiftly mounting deposits either by investments or loans on the other, Wall Street banks continue to wage a losing battle. A study of the quarterly statements of condition of the 15 largest banks in the financial district issued last week reveals that while deposits in the aggregate rose nearly 6% in the quarter to a new record high, loans and discounts actually declined. Holdings of government securities gained only 4.4%. Idle cash jumped 9.6%. The gain in deposits, continues Mr. Conlon, of the 15 banks was far greater in the three months just completed than in the final quarter of 1939. In the first quarter of 1940, deposits of the 15 banks reached a new peak of $15 billion or more, up $857 million. The gain since a year ago is now $2,720,000,000, or 21%. Total resources of $17,185,000,000 were up $875,000,000, or 5.4% for the quarter, and up $2,702,000,000, or 18%, from a year ago. Unquote. Recollect once more that the Federal Reserve Banking Act was passed to provide an elastic currency, that it has failed to do so is obvious from the figures just quoted, and obvious since 1920. That date is seven years after the Federal Reserve Banks came into existence. Seven years spent in regimenting the financial facilities of this nation to expend at that time $25 billion of loans to the Allies for the conduct of the First World War. Loans which we know, for the most part, have been repudiated. I might interject a thought at this juncture relative to currency money. As of March 20, 1940, there was issued for the United States of America $7,599,000,000 of currency represented by the silver coins and the billfold money that you have in your purse. Now, probably more than $2 billion of that amount is in hiding, in safety deposit vaults or in foreign banks. It is estimated that not much more than $5 billion is in actual circulation in America and in the vaults of local banks. Please keep that point clearly in mind. And do not confuse currency money either with bank deposits, with resources, or with credit money. Thus, again, quoting Mr. Conlon, and his figures are accurate, being taken from the quarterly statements of the banks themselves, quoting him, we read, the five big banks on the list, the Chase National, the National City Bank, the Garnty Trust Company, the Bankers Trust Company, and the Central Hanover Bank and Trust Company, these five banks accounted for $10,268,472,000, or approximately two-thirds of the total deposits of the 15 largest banks in Wall Street. The Chase Bank deposits topped the three billion dollar level for the first time in the history of the commercial bank, unquote. My friends, although actual currency money in circulation or in banks does not amount to much more than five billion dollars, the balance of the seven billion and a half being hidden or out of circulation, five New York banks alone have deposits of ten billion two hundred and sixty-eight million $472,000. One bank, the Chase National, has deposits in excess of $3 billion. And this, in times of depression, this 
seven years after all, the banks of this nation were closed because they could not pay the real depositors dollar for dollar. It is evident from these figures that under the present financial system, the farmers, the laborers, the small businessmen, and the uninformed citizens who depend largely upon currency money did not prosper during these past seven years to any marked degree. Permit me now to read for you an excerpt from the Congressional Record of April 5, page 6186. Therein we read the following. The Chase National Bank of New York reports that its deposits on March 30 were $3,060,768,704, well over $3 billion. A new world's record for a commercial bank. It is not, unfortunately, a record to be viewed with satisfaction. The reports from banks in many cities showing deposits at higher levels than ever before are more exact than the estimates of men unemployed, but hardly less disturbing. For a large proportion of these dollars are unemployed dollars. The Chase, for instance, has a cash position of a billion and a half, indicating a situation common to all larger banks, that deposits are increasing much more rapidly than they can be lent and put to work. It has nearly another billion in government, state, and local securities. But it had out in loans and discounts only a little more than one-fifth of its total deposits. That, that is super liquidity, making for great safety, but not for business activity. The unemployment of men and the unemployment of dollars are twin problems. And every needless obstacle to the employment of dollars is an obstacle to the employment of men, unquote congressional records. The Federal Reserve Board, the government watchdog appointed by the President of the United States, this board is empowered to control not only the Federal Reserve Banks directly, but indirectly the Chase National Bank and all the member banks of the Federal Reserve System. It is empowered to supervise the activities of these banks, directly or indirectly, to the end that these banks will furnish an elastic currency. That's so. Yet here, in this one bank, the Chase, with a cash position of more than one and a half billion dollars, if by cash this bank means currency, what is the actual amount of currency available outside banks for the great mass of you people? You farmers, laborers, and small businessmen. The fact is, there is no adequate elastic currency to conduct the business of this nation that is languishing in want despite the plenitude surrounding us. The fact is, in my opinion, the Federal Reserve Board is more interested in directing the banks to purchase the government debt at 10 cents on the dollar. As an instance, more than 30% of the total resources of the 15 largest banks in New York City are used for that purpose. Relative to the Chase National Bank of New York, we read on page 6186 of the Congressional Record for 1940 what the Honorable Clary Hoffman says. These are his words. The point I want to make now is that this vast sum is in the Chase National Bank of New York and other large sums in other banks lying idle and unemployed as sterile as the billions of dollars worth of gold buried in the Kentucky hills," unquote Representative Hoffman. 
on page 6243 of the Congressional Record for April 1940, Honorable Robert F. Rich of Pennsylvania supplies us with the following information. Says he, the present session of Congress appropriated six billion seven hundred and seventy-six million and some odd dollars to be spent this year, more than a billion dollars of the revenue anticipated by Mr. Roosevelt from the taxpayers. Addressing the House of Representatives again, Mr. Rich said, quotations, we want to chase the money changers out of the White House and out of Congress if we are going to save this nation of ours. Now, where are the economic royalists? We are putting the financial skids under this nation. We will soon be a bankrupt nation. Oncoming generations will not be able to carry on the folly that this New Deal administration is heaping upon their heads, unquote Mr. Rich. My friends, granting that billions of debt dollars represented in bonds are held by the banks, granting that they were created for productive purposes, even though some of them were used to plow under cotton, slaughter pigs, pay bonuses for not producing to great land-owning corporations like the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and pay less than living wages to the poor, uninformed, unorganized victims of the financial depression who labored on the WPA. Granting all this, let us not forget that these Billions upon billions of debt dollars represented in bonds held by the banks cost the banks only 10 cents on the dollar. Is it not a new kind of usury to obligate you taxpayers not only to liquidate the principal of some of these bonds, but to pay interest on 90% of them when the banks got them for nothing except for a flourish of a fountain pen. From accurate governmental figures, observe what burdens this financial system has contributed in heaping more debt upon the backs of you people. On page 6078 of the Congressional Record for April 4, Mr. Chester H. Gross of Pennsylvania, Congressman, addressed the House of Representatives. He said, quotations, I learned a day or two ago that the national debt now exceeds $48 billion, and that this has been an increase from $21 billion during this present administration. The interest on that vast amount of money at the present low rate is far beyond a billion dollars a year. I am wondering if we plunged into a period of prosperity and interest rates advanced to where we have seen them in the good old days, how we could raise the money just to pay the interest. In 1913, our government cost $34 per family to operate. In 1939, it cost $540 per family. Our national debt is now more than $1,500 per family. This refers only to the federal debt, unquote the Congress. I might add to what Mr. Gross has said, the following comment. The banks hold more than $18 billion of Federal Reserve bonds purchased for 10 cents on the dollar. There are 30 million families in the United States. Thus, each family, each family owes the banks of the United States 
$600 on the principal of these federal bonds alone. And I might inquire of the bankers, what is the chance for this money to be paid you when two-thirds of our families are living on an average monthly income of $69? There is something for the bankers to ponder upon. There is something for all citizens to ponder upon. Simple mathematics indicate, in my opinion, that continuing the present financial system of selling a tremendous portion of our debt to the bankers at 10 cents on the dollar, neither the federal debt will be paid nor will the compound interest be paid to the bankers. Again, I recall for your consideration the first words of the Federal Reserve Act, namely, quotations, an act to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve Banks to furnish an elastic currency, to afford means of rediscounting commercial paper, to establish a more effective supervision of banking in the United States and for other purposes, unquote, this government act. In my opinion, the present banking system, which is, for all practical purposes, the Federal Reserve Banking System, and which functions through the manipulation of credit or debt money, and not through the general circulation of currency money, this, in my opinion, this present banking system has contributed largely to the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few and to the detriment of the two-thirds of our population forced to live on an average monthly income of $69 per family. To support this view, let me quote Senator Joseph O'Mahony, who says on page 5934 of the Congressional Record for April 1940, the following words, quotation. There are 30 great American corporations, each with assets of more than a billion dollars. There are 22 states, sovereign states, in the Union, the entire assessed value of whose real estate is less than a billion dollars each. There are 16 states in the Federal Union, the total assessed value of all the property of which, both real and personal, is less than a billion dollars each, real and personal. The senator then held up a chart to show his fellow senators. Then referring to the chart, he said, this chart shows that the largest of these 30 great corporations are the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company and the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, both of them great institutions, both of them most helpful institutions, but each one of them having assets of more than $4 billion each. Only the states of Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, New Jersey, Michigan, Massachusetts, California, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, only these states are financially stronger than those two institutions. Do you wonder, continues the senator, do you wonder why political centralism has developed? Our economic life is necessarily centralized because of the development and improvement of technology, and it has developed. The people have turned more and more to Washington for governance, for aid, for relief, for all manner of contributions. And why? Because the states are no longer sufficiently wealthy and powerful to cope 
with the economic problem. Unquote the senator. <coughs> Pardon me. The senator could have included in his litany of giant corporations the privately owned five great banks of New York City. As Mr. Condlin, whom I quoted previously, remarked, the banks know that they are playing a losing game. Consequently, my friend, it is rumored in financial and political circles that since these banks cannot see their way clear to lend money to American producers, they are devising ways and means to lend it to European belligerents. Previously, I said, that through the Federal Reserve Banks, affiliates, we loaned approximately $25 billion to the Allies, government and privately owned bank loans, between 1914 and 1920. Pertinent to all this, it was some months ago when discussing the cash and carry provision of the Neutrality Act, I predicted that it would soon develop into a credit and carry provision. Thus, according to the Chicago Daily Tribune of Tuesday, April 9, 1940, we read the following quotation. Representatives of the British Purchasing Mission in this country have approached Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace for government credit with which to purchase American agricultural products according to information received by members of the Senate today. The British representatives made their appeal for credit at a recent conference with Secretary Wallace and other officials of the Agriculture Department, including the heads of the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, the Commodity Credit Corporation, and the Surplus Commodities Corporation, members of the Senate were informed. The British spokesman, it is said, bluntly inquired, China's credit is good, Finland's credit is good, why isn't our credit good? Why? Although Secretary Wallace did not encourage the British in their desire for credit, it is understood that one of his solicitors made a study of the Neutrality Act of 1939 as well as of the Johnson Act and prepared a memorandum holding that there is no statutory prohibition against the extension of credits to belligerents by such government agencies as the Export-Import Bank and the Commodity Credit Corporation, unquote the Chicago Daily Tribune article. My friend, it is peculiar that this British mission approached Mr. Wallace the Secretary of Agriculture. In fact, it is ironical when we read the following record. Here it is. Reports from the Department of Commerce, and I'm again reading the Congressional Record for April 4, 1940, page 6079. Reports from the Department of Commerce show that under our trade treaties, we have imported in 1939 vegetables valued at $18,112,000. We have imported 93,859,000 pounds of potatoes. We have imported dairy products worth 
$14,142,000, or 78,698,000 pounds of dairy products. We have imported poultry and egg products worth $1,800,000. We have imported 753,570 head of live cattle worth $20,206,000 and 150,794,000 pounds of meat products worth $27,312,000. We've imported canned tomatoes, 55,400,000 pounds. Raw tomatoes, 48,793,000 pounds. And while the farmer who has a beef hide to sell usually gets enough money for it to buy a pair of work shoes, we have imported 223,446,000 pounds of hides worth $47,056,400. Surely it becomes the job of the Secretary of Agriculture and the President who say we planned it so to explain why the American farmer shall be thrown into competition with the rest of the world, unquote the record. These figures indicate how we Americans already have been helping foreign farmers to the disparagement of our own through the operations of the Department of Agriculture the Department of Commerce, and the trade treaties of the Department of State. According to the reports just submitted, official report, the British mission is actively engaged in securing credit in America. The log-jammed hoard of wealth in the banks of the vaults of which I was speaking magnetizes them. I ask you, shall we Americans complacently observe the Johnson Acts being nullified, an act which prohibits certain loans to certain belligerents? Shall cash and carry become credit and carry? thereby engaging us in the first inevitable step which leads to actual war. These questions, together with the mystery of the buried gold at Fort Knox, Kentucky, all linked up with international finance and with war, I discuss in this week's issue of, issue of Social Justice, now on your newsstand. And we'll continue to discuss in future lectures and future editions of Social Justice. In the course of these lectures, I shall become constructive, submitting my opinions in a program for perfecting our present financial system and for keeping our money at home. At the moment, may I transfer your thoughts to the subject of war and to the duty resting on all Americans to exert every influence in private and in public to keep out of it, if for no other reason than that it is chiefly to my mind a war between modern capitalism and anti-capitalism, neither of which systems operate for the benefit of the peoples of the world. The First World War was a war between two capitalistic empires struggling for world supremacy. It was advertised as a war to end all wars, and did it. 
Senator Robert Reynolds of North Carolina says on this point of our entering the First World War, I'm quoting the congressional record again, by entering that war, we would stop all wars for all time. We felt that we would thereby save Christianity and save democracy. But fortunately, for this hour and for this time, the passage of time has revealed to us that we were blinded to the situation and that our participation did not have the result which our brothers across the sea told us it would. Let us see about that. It did not stop all wars. For since the World War, Italy conquered about 15 million people in Ethiopia. Since the World War, there raged in Paraguay and Bolivia a tremendous war, which took as its toll about eight-tenths of the male population. In addition to that, there raged a civil war in Spain, which began in July 36, and that lasted until last year, in which more than two million people were killed, in addition to that, there has raged, raged in Asia a war between the Japanese and Chinese. And up to date, more than a million Japanese have been killed and more than three million Chinese have been killed and more than a hundred million Chinese have been rendered homeless out of a population of from 450 to 500 million people. So much then for the hope of ending all wars. Our intervention did not do so. And the senator has not included the wars fought in the meantime by the British in India. Again, quoting the Congressional Record for April 4, 1940, page 6055, we read the following astonishing figures. In the last 150 years, Great Britain has fought a total of 54 wars, lasting in all 102 years. In the last 150 years, the British Empire has been at war 68% of the time. In the last 150 years, France has engaged in 53 wars, lasting 99 years. In the last 150 years, France has been at war 66% of the time. And indeed, were we to look at the record of our world war enemy, the German Empire, we would find but little less encouragement, unquote the record. Again, I insist, my friends, that we have a plenitude of problems at home with which to engage ourselves. Shall we continue using the sterile gold in Kentucky to protect the billions of dollars of bankers' bonds, or shall we use it to beget prosperity? Shall we continue borrowing money from the owners of the Federal Reserve Banks, permitting them to reap in interest on 90% of the bonds which they created by a stroke of the fountain pen? Or shall Congress issue tax-free money predicated not upon the debt of the nation, but upon its wealth? In the pages of social justice, 
and again next Sunday afternoon at the same hour. I shall pursue these subjects to the end that we Americans who enjoy political liberty will acquire economic liberty without which the former is but an idle dream. My friends, there is a financial system which will solve the problem of distribution. There is a financial system which will permit the plenty of our fields, our factories and mines and forests to be enjoyed by you people. There is a financial system which will free us from the manacles of debt. There is a financial system which will multiply private ownership and protect it instead of confiscating. In the meantime, let us not lose hope of evolving that system, nor let us adopt the defeatist attitude so common among many of our people that the only use we can put our money to now hoarded in the banks is into the cannons, the shell holes, and the corpses in Europe. Let us stay out of the war now raging in Europe, and we can stay out of it. We must stay out of it no matter what happens. Keep our money out of it, and we can keep our men out of it. And for these last eight or nine minutes, May I speak to you on a biblical, scriptural passage. Current on many lips is a pessimistic statement. This is the end of Christianity. It is uttered by the enemies of the cross. It is spoken by the disciples of the flesh. It is whispered even by lukewarm Christians, this is the end of Christianity. Christianity failed in Russia, behold its Stalinism. Christianity failed in Germany, behold its Hitlerism. Christianity failed in Mexico, in Spain and Italy, in every country in the world. Or oh, behold the miseries and the democracies, the slavery and the empires, the universal turmoil now shaking the pillars of civilization. Such is the pessimistic comment of those who do not understand that Christ's kingdom is not of this world, and that Christ prayed not for this world, a world in which there shall be wars and rumors of wars, injustice and practices of injustice, until the consummation of time. My friends, Christianity has not failed. The world has failed to accept it. Meanwhile, although the Stalins and Hitlers are discredited in pulpit, press, and lecture hall, what voices, I ask you, have been raised to discredit the doctrines of Karl Marx, practiced by the dictators of Russia and Germany. Marxism with its sordid materialism, its heaven upon earthism, is still the gospel followed by those who glory in the tribulations of the Christian church, predicting its dissolution. Peace and security is their watchword. Peace and security is the shibboleth they cry to allure the thoughtless thousands to their standards. My friends, peace and security is no new clarion call. It was sounded in the Roman Forum in the days of the Apostles. 
It was the propaganda employed to weld the chains of intellectual slavery upon the minds and souls of those already enduring physical slavery. Peace and security, as greatly desired as they are, must not confuse the major issue of our soul, salvation. Oh, but listen to St. Paul not to be. In the fifth chapter of his letter to the Thessalonians, St. Paul writes as follows, quotation, Of the times and moments, brethren, you need not that we should write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and security, ah, then shall sudden destruction be upon them as the pains upon her that is with child and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, you are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. For all you are the children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that are drunk, are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day, let us be sober, having on the breastplate of faith and charity, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but unto the purchasing of salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Unquote St. Paul. My friends, of these times and moments, times tempestuous and moments tragic, I need not speak to you. I need only warn you that when worldly men speak loudest, of peace and security, the sudden destruction awaiting them is near at hand. As for yourselves, who are of the day, gifted with the sunshine of faith, act not as if you are of the night, groping in the black mists of darkness. My friends, you are destined to live if others are destined to perish. Therefore, preserve yourselves blameless and spotless against the coming of the Lord. And may I conclude this message by quoting again from St. Paul to the Thessalonians who says, May the Lord multiply you and make you abound in charity towards one another and towards all men as we do also towards you. My friends, there is only one peace. The peace of Jesus Christ there is only one security, the security of everlasting life. God bless you. May it be my privilege to make you a copy of today's lecture as well as of this thought for the week. Ladies and gentlemen, naturally there are thousands of you in this audience who will avail themselves of the invitation to secure a copy of today's illuminating lecture as well as a copy of the Thought for the Week with which your reverend speaker concluded this broadcast. 
Father Coughlin has instructed me to invite all in this audience who desire to receive regularly the weekly edition of Social Justice to write directly to him. Copies of this afternoon's lecture are free for the asking. Invite your friends to listen in next Sunday at this same hour and over these same stations to the fourth lecture in this series. And now, thanking you for your kind cooperation and generous assistance in maintaining this fully paid-for commercial broadcast, this is your announcer, Franklin Mitchell, inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time. We have presented the regular Sunday afternoon program of Father Charles E. Coughlin from the Shrine of the Little Flower, Royal Oak, Michigan. Statements made and views expressed during this program were those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the policies of this station. Father Coughlin's address came to you as a presentation on your dial at 1,250 kilocycles. WHBI, Hoyt Brothers Incorporated, Newark, New Jersey.